Welcome to the Saving Lives Podcast. I'm Eddie Joe. Today's the 11th of December of 2020. Today, we're going to be discussing using non-invasive ventilation, which a lot of us call BiPAP, and how it is used in acute asthma exacerbations. It was formally published a couple days ago in the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine, which in all honesty is one of the highest impact factor journals in critical care. So they, generally speaking, only publish the good stuff there. And I definitely have to tip my hat off to the authors who published the study and wrote it because I think they did a good job with the information that they were able to obtain. Believe it or not, there's not a lot of good information and a lot of good data out there with regards to using either high flow nasal cannula or non-invasive ventilation for patients who have acute asthma exacerbations. If you're interested in learning more about using high flow nasal cannula in asthma exacerbations, you should check out the podcast that came out right before this one. Even though that study was a pilot study, you know, we didn't see any adverse effects using high flow nasal cannula. So it's, a, it's something we could have in our back pockets when we take care of these patients in the emergency department or throughout the hospital. But the focus of this podcast is to talk about non-invasive ventilation. The purpose of using non-invasive ventilation, obviously, in people who have asthma exacerbations is similar to that of patients who have COPD we want to keep them off the ventilator because we know what happens when you put somebody on mechanical ventilation. Welcome to the Saving Lives Podcast. I'm Eddie Joe. Today's the 11th of December of 2020. Today, we're going to be discussing using non-invasive ventilation, which a lot of us call BiPAP. The study that I'm going to be using as a citation to this podcast, which I definitely re- recommend that you check it out for yourself and not trust me, is titled Non-Invasive Ventilation Use in Critically Ill Patients with Acute Asthma Exacerbations. It was formally published a couple days ago in the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine, which in all honesty is one of the highest impact factor journals in critical care. So they, generally speaking, only publish the good stuff there. And I definitely have to tip my hat off to the authors who published the study and wrote it because I think they did a good job with the information that they were able to obtain. Believe it or not, there's not a lot of good information and a lot of good data out there with regards to using either high flow nasal cannula or non-invasive ventilation for patients who have acute asthma exacerbations and how it is used in acute asthma exacerbations. If you're interested in learning more about using high flow nasal cannula in asthma exacerbations, you should check out the podcast that came out right before this one. Even though that study was a pilot study, you know, we didn't see any adverse effects using high flow nasal cannula. So it's, a, it's something we could have in our back pockets when we take care of these patients in the emergency department or throughout the hospital. But the focus of this podcast is to talk about non-invasive ventilation. There are lots of complications, you know, for example, just the process of intubating a patient who is already likely hypercapnic and has a low pH and, you know, you're not getting a good min- ventilation into them. And then you RSI them and then you don't ventilate them properly then either. And you're not titrating your I to E ratios appropriately on the ventilator. It just, it just becomes a mess. Better to try to let these patients sort themselves out first before going down that road. And of course, I'm not going to go down through the nitty gritty of how to take care of a acute asthma exacerbation, but we all should know that these patients may need supplemental oxygen. They are going to need bronchodilators. They're going to need anticholinergics. They're going to need steroids. Some people choose to give these people mag. And then there's a number of practice preferences out there that each one of us have. But overall, if you do a deep dive through the literature, which I actually did a couple of years ago with regards to asthma exacerbations and non-invasive ventilation, you're going to be hard pressed to find some good, robust data. In the introduction to this paper, the authors talk about the fact that asthma exacerbations lead to 2 million ED visits and half a million hospitalizations every year. You know, it's, it's an expensive process. And then, you know, what they say is that approximately 10% of patients will end up in the ICU, which, which isn't good. And then 2 to 4% of these people need to be tubed, which is also something that we're trying to avoid. And so to help us figure out how we should manage these patients, These authors went ahead and they did a type of study called a retrospective cohort study. What that means is that they're basically looking back in time and they were able to get a hold of data from a database that included over 700 hospitals in the United States, which is pretty cool. And then the timetable from where from where this was taken was from 2010 up to 2017. So since this is a podcast that talks about adults, this paper is also about adults because honestly, kids scare the crud out of me. So this, these data are not applicable for 
So I want to get this out of the way in case this is one of the things you were looking for in this particular podcast, but the authors do not make any recommendations as to what settings to put the patient on on non-invasive ventilation. I mean, it's really hard to do that in a retrospective cohort study like this one, in addition to the fact that they looked at a total of 53,654 patients with an asthma exacerbation, which, which honestly is a lot. I'm not going to get into all the different nuances of how, you know, these, these authors went ahead and did all these statistical jumping jacks to come up with these numbers. But when they went ahead and did the evaluation of it, they found that 25.2% of patients were put on non-invasive ventilation and 27% of these patients, of all patients, excuse me, ended up being intubated. One of the things that's interesting is that of this whole group of patients, 2,000, excuse me, 1,291 patients died, which means that the mortality rate for these severe asthma exacerbations is 2.4, which is pretty astounding to me because it's kind of crazy that that people people die of asthma. That's 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 a horrible way to go. If I'm being honest with you, as I mentioned before, about 13,500 patients required or received, better said, non-invasive ventilation. But they were able to um, keep a bunch of these people off of the ventilator. And so only 22.3 of patients who were put on non-invasive ventilation actually required to be intubated. It is pretty tough, though, that these people were refractory to non-invasive ventilation. So then they required mechanical ventilation. And then those who require mechanical ventilation, 4.5 of these patients, excuse me, 4.5% of these patients went on to die, unfortunately. When they put all these numbers together, they were able to find that using non-invasive ventilation, again, what a lot of us go ahead and call BiPAP, was associated with a lower odds of needing to be intubated. And in addition to that, they also had lower odds of in-hospital mortality. So these are some, these are some benefits to using non-invasive ventilation in these patients. All in all, I mean, I wish it would be better if we actually had, you know, for example, a prospective randomized controlled trial but that's actually very difficult to achieve, especially with the fact that you can't you can't quite blind the patients, staff, physicians, anybody to you know what what therapy they got, whether it was non-invasive ventilation or high flow nasal cannula or, for example, just conventional oxygen therapy. You can't blind. I have found it to be useful. Within the discussion of this article, the authors state that their study was the first to find that non-invasive ventilation is beneficial in reducing the need for invasive mechanical ventilation in patients with acute asthma exacerbation. And so we're starting to see some benefit now in the literature that this could be helpful for our patients. But let's be honest with ourselves. Many of us have been using non-invasive ventilation for patients with acute asthma exacerbations for years. I mean, we, we've we seen and we've noticed that, you know, this could potentially be a bridge of sorts to try to allow the patients, um, the, the patients reactive airways and, you know, allow them to receive the steroids, get the bronchodilators and kind of get over the hump so that their asthma exacerbation could go ahead and subside. Another problem that the authors went ahead and stated is that, let's say, for example, somebody wants to go ahead and do a large randomized control trial to kind of delineate this and figure out what the answer to the question is. Are you, if you are an ED doc, an ED respiratory therapist, an ED nurse, are you going to allow your patient to receive some potentially suboptimal therapy that the patient got randomized to, as opposed to just being put on something that you know works? You know, that's part of the fact of, that's part of what makes research so tricky. And, you know, we might not have good, robust data ever in the future to show us, hey, you know, using non-invasive ventilation is fantastic. You should use it as your first-line therapy if the patient looks a certain way or has a certain ABG or whatnot. Again, we'll we'll, we'll never know these things. So if somebody ever asks, is there any data for using non-invasive ventilation in acute asthma exacerbations? You can now say, hey, you know, this guy, Eddie Joe MD, haha, uh, he, he, he did this podcast on the topic. I know in my practice, I go ahead and I put people on non-invasive ventilation every now and then. But one of the things that you have to make sure you set up properly on the non-invasive ventilation is that their I to E ratio is set for something that would compensate for this obstructive physiology. You know, usually you and I are breathing at about one second inspiratory, 
three seconds expiratory. But again, these people have an obstructive process. So you need to potentially shorten up the I time and prolong the E time so that the patient could go ahead and exhale and get all that CO2 out. Overall, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. I appreciate your support. Link to the article in the show notes down below. Hope you all have a great day.